Dear Journal, I am Xeno King Arthur, except I have an alien lava scimitar instead of some piddly steel sword, so I'm pretty sure I win, but at the same time, fuck my life. Again. I woke up, which is more than I had assumed I would manage when I had gone to sleep. I think I remembered something about the human body only being able to survive three days or so without water, and by my estimate, I had been in that escape pod with Captain Royds for a good decade, so pretty close to the three day mark unless I miss my guess by much. Once I had woken up, however, any expectations I had from that point on went out the window. First of all, I was on a ship, but not a ship I recognised. I was pretty proud of myself that I could recognise the humming of an FDL drive without even trying. What can I say? I'm a quick study when it comes to street smarts. The only problem was that this ship, which I didn't recognise, did have some rather disturbing similarities to another kind of ship I'd seen only in the movies. A troop transport. From what I could see of it, the ship appeared to be merely one massive room, divided into sections with half walls. Each of these sections contained ten bump beds, most of which were occupied by aliens of all shapes and sizes, each wearing nearly the exact same thing. Well, not the exact same thing, since the participating species couldn't seem to agree on the correct number of arms or legs, or in a few cases heads, but the clothes were the same colour at least. Those clothes were a black shirt and red pants, and I have to say it was pretty sharp. At least it would have looked sharp if it weren't for the numerous sweat stains, and the fact that not everyone seemed to be wearing a shirt, but at least the potential was there. I had bigger problems other than the blatant fashion crimes taking place right in front of me. Like, where was I? And why hadn't I been given such a dapper uniform? I could have pulled it off better than half the Xenos there. Then the thing I'd been trying to ignore hit me like a fly on the windshield of a Japanese bullet train. I was on a troop transport. I was on a troop transport. I was a troop being transported. Will Smith's voice entered my mind, helping me out with the words I couldn't properly say. Oh hell no! Nah. I couldn't be drafted into the army. I'd won! I'd beaten back the evil lizard ants and had even managed to survive getting hit by one and a half of those anti-tank rounds. And now I wasn't even allowed to go back and be adored as a hero again? I just started being able to talk to Mama too. Really, who did I piss off so badly upstairs that it wouldn't even let me do a victory lap once I had done the right thing. It's fine. I'm good. I'm not mad. I just need to take a deep breath and calm down. I'm going to be fine. How bad could it be, anyway? I was alive, which is always a good start, and they had given me a bed, which meant they could see right off the bat that I was sapient, which is better than could have been said for the experience I had endured last time I had awoken on an unfamiliar ship. It wasn't like the Blue Giraffes had been my home anyway. I was trying to get to my real home. And if this way was faster than I embraced it, I'm okay. I really am. Deep breaths. As I wasn't dead, I could assume my new hosts, whoever they were, were friendly. Or at least non-hostile. They had even given me my new alien lava scimitar in its sheath. They weren't studying me like Dick and Shifty had wanted to either. What do they want from me then? I knew it looked like a troop transport, so maybe they wanted me to be a cook. Perhaps a worker. I didn't exactly know on what level these aliens waged war, so I could be something as preposterous as a trench digger, although that would suck to an endless degree. But regardless of what role they wanted me to fulfil, why would they have given me a bunk with the rest of the soldiers? My eyes fell upon the lava scimitar again. Oh no... You have got to be kidding me. Seriously. They wanted me to be a soldier? It's not like I wouldn't make a damn fine one if the soldiers were anything like the Xenos I've fought so far, but the powers that were had no way of knowing that. What kind of idiot would draft someone they found, metaphorically speaking, on the other side of the road and just decide, yeah, he looks kind of mean, he'll make a great addition to our army. But sir, the other guy would say, He's drunk and passed out and sleeping in a pile of his own feces. And look, there's a dead guy right next to him. It looks like he just up and murdered that lizard ant with a sword. You want that in our ranks? And then the commander would just smile as he slowly nodded, murmuring, He's perfect. Who does that? I can tell you right now, no one in their right minds. 
maybe you'd do that to a guy if you were going to training. I mean, I had been in pretty bad shape, and if someone had offered to let me join the army or stay in my pod with roids, would have taken up arms right there. But I, obviously, wasn't on my way to training. The aliens around me moved with too much confidence. It wasn't bravado, they were just sure of themselves. They each looked like a fit specimen of their own species, and the way in which they handled themselves as they moved spoke of training and discipline. I also saw quite a few weapons out of weapons lockers and in the hands of their owners, so that might have helped out my observations as well. Just a little. My brooding was interrupted when a sound issued from the top bunk of the bed I was sitting on. From over the side, a long, thin vase with orange skin and what looked like a multitude of warts poked into my view. It had slits for pupils in its red eyes. I have to say that I probably would have peed a little if I had any water to pee. It said something, and I was almost relieved that it wasn't a bunch of unintelligible clicks. If I closed my eyes, I could almost believe that it was some language from Earth that I didn't know rather than an alien tongue. This was encouraging, since it meant I actually had a chance of some basic communication with this guy, so long as I was going to be spending a good deal of time with this guy, which I had a feeling I was. The reason I'd never tried learning any of the Blue Giraffe's words was because I physically couldn't. I didn't think they were even able to talk in the same way I was, and I knew they had made several sounds which I would have been hard-pressed to replicate. I couldn't have even told them my name, since it would have just sounded like grunts to them. But this guy knew I was sapient and had similar vocal cords to me. My time here was already off to a better start than it ever had before. I still couldn't understand what he said though. Where was a Yoda when you needed one? He seemed frustrated that I couldn't understand him, but at the same time as though he had confirmed something. He hopped down from the bed where I could see the rest of him. He was about 50 centimeters taller than me and a good deal thinner. He had five legs and four arms, but a normal sized neck and, as I had noticed before, orange skin. The warts also seemed to be a general skin feature as well. Poor bloke. He spoke to me again, but this time as though one with the understanding that I couldn't speak his language and vice versa. Using all four hands to motion towards himself, he said one word. Manthiel. Dang it. Now, it would have been rude to call him Toad. I was pretty proud of that one too. It was one of my best. Better than Warty, at least. Fine. I guess I could call him by his real name. I might as well get the pronunciation correct as well. Manthiel? I said, looking to him in askance. He nodded, which I hope meant the same thing to him as it did to me. Confirming it once more in my mind, I said it again. Manthiel. Now it was my turn. I learned my lessons well, and I remembered clearly the words my mother had said to me when I was just a boy. Son, she said, never give your name to a stranger you have just met on the street. School is fine, but outside of school, and to people who aren't your own age, they don't need to know your name. And if they ask, just tell them something else. Well, I sure as heck wasn't in school, and I had no idea how old this guy was, so I wasn't giving him my name, no siree. I decided not to lie to him, however. Lying is wrong, that's another thing Mother said. Gesturing to myself in the same way he had, except with only two arms, I told him as much as I was willing. Human. He mouthed the word several times, then said it back to me in the same way I had when I'd heard his name. Human. 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 I gave him a thumbs up without thinking. Then he reciprocated the gesture. It was so unexpected that I burst out laughing. I hadn't seen such a human gesture in so long, it felt like I'd gone in for a bro fist and he'd returned one with a secret handshake. He smiled at my mirth, or maybe he was getting ready to rip my throat out since I'd insulted his ancestors with my laughter or something. I don't know. He didn't attack, so I guess smarts meant the same thing to him as they did to me. I was so happy with the progress I'd already made. Manthio, you're already a better friend than any alien I've ever met. Just don't try to feed me lettuce or lock me in my bunk and we'll be off to a good start. As it is, though, you don't happen to have any purple Xeno pig rats, do you? I'm starving and I would love some if you happen to have any. Apparently he didn't, but he had something even worse than lettuce, it seemed. He took me over to what looked like a bird feeder in the back wall of our cubicle, which was also the hull of the ship. In the little bucket, which appeared to be the end of a chute that disappeared into the wall at an area unknown, was a magnitude of grey spheres, each slightly smaller than my fist. I looked at Manthew on the spheres, nonplussed. He motioned towards the spheres. 
I continued to stare at him. Exasperated, he picked one up and bit into it. It looked like it had the constancy of bread dough. You know what? I've changed my mind. Lettuce is what I'm craving right now. Please? Mantheal just stared at me, encouraging me to take one of the spheres. I was starving, and there seemed to be nothing else, so I picked one up and took a bite. It tasted like nothing. Not the nothing of water, which is actually something, or the nothing of cucumbers brought from Walmart. This was literally nothing. I had been right about the texture though. It was the feeling of bread dough in my mouth with absolutely nothing registered by my tongue, except that there was indeed some form of matter in my mouth. It was disgusting, but at the same time, palatable. I ate it, and it seemed my body was in the mood for food more than it was for satisfying my craving for something with a taste. I ate another one. They were actually filling, despite their size. Still, they were about as large as a small apple, and I hadn't eaten in days. After the first two, I guessed how many I would eat and grabbed six more. After I had as many as I thought was reasonable, I looked back up at Mantheal. He was gaping at me, mouth open significantly wider than I thought his jaw should have been able to go. In fact, I think he had disconnected it like a snake's, and it was quite a horrifying sight. I swore and backed away from him, but he just continued to stare. I looked around at the other aliens in our cubicle. I don't think they had noticed me until now, but they were staring at me with similar expressions as Mantheal. I looked and saw that most of them were holding partially disassembled spheres, except not a one held more than three. What? I'm hungry, I protested. Just because I'm fat doesn't mean I'm not beautiful. Oblivious to how rude their fat shaming was, they continued to stare. I pointedly ignored them and sat down to enjoy my quite literally tasteless meal. I had been very accurate with my guess and felt contently full when I finished off the last of my spheres. I looked up and sure enough, each and every one of the men, some might have been women, were watching at me, even more shocked than before if that was possible. It seemed like a couple of aliens with adjacent cubicles had come to stop and stare as well. I decided to just ignore the haters and moved back to the wall where I thought I recognised a tap similar to the one that had been in my cargo bay all that time ago, when I thought I was going to stay there for longer than about an hour. I remembered how Dink had worked it. Dang, I hope the kid was alright, and was rewarded by a steam of water running into a trough in the wall next to the sphere depository. The moment my lips touched the water, I realised how thirsty I was, and drank for nearly two minutes, taking just enough time between drinks to breathe and make sure I didn't puke. They were still staring when I got up and wiped my mouth at the back of my sleeve. Don't you guys have anything better to do? It seemed they did, because no sooner had I spoken than an electric buzzer sounded throughout the ship, pausing everyone in their movements. It was eerie. Everyone in the entire ship, it seemed, stood still a moment as the buzzer sounded. Then a collective deep breath rang through the entire ship, as though it was time to face the inevitable. When everyone started moving again, it was with a new sense of purpose, the things to do that could be put off no longer. All the soldiers in my cubicle, or squad I guessed, took out guns from storage bins in their bunks, checking over them with a practiced and efficient ease, although I'm pretty sure I'd seen most of them checking the same weapons only a few minutes before. Combat harnesses were being donned, and I had the distinct feeling that I was missing out on some serious preparation. The purpose with which everyone was moving did nothing to assuage the fear that was slowly rising in my chest. Mantheo quickly got on his gear, the motion for me to follow him. We walked a short distance to a small booth in the middle of the hall between all the cubicles. He punched a few keys in the console and a mechanism within the booth clanked and ground as he responded to Mantheo's request. A gun and a combat harness were presented by two mechanical arms which came out of the booth. Mantheo grabbed the gun and harness and handed them to me. I knew how to put on the harness, but I think the ray gun was broken. It was all bent up as though for storage, and it didn't look as though it was supposed to be able to be reconfigured. When I had grabbed the handle and nothing had happened, Mantheo also seemed confused. I looked up when someone else approached the booth, getting out of the way. This new arrival just needed a gun, and when his new weapon was presented to him, similarly bent as mine. He confidently grasped it about the handle and walked away content. I could see why. The moment his hand grasped the thing, it seemed to melt and fold upon itself, reconfiguring itself until it seemed to have been custom-built for that particular alien. Ah, I said, understanding. The computer doesn't know what kind of creature I am, so it doesn't know how to change to my physiology. 
I doubt it'll let me fire even if it did. Malthiel seemed to have reached the same conclusion, but he looked a little more put out than I did about it. I tried to reassure him. Don't worry about it, man. I don't need a gun anyway. It'll just cramp up my style. All I need is the lava scimitar I got back in my bunk, and I'll be good. Malthiel didn't seem convinced. Okay, he just hadn't understood a word I had said, but even if he had, I doubt he would have been convinced. There was nothing we could do, though, so we walked back to our cubicle, where I slung the lava scimitar sheaf over my back, where it fit surprisingly well. I was lucky I still had the sheaf, or else I wouldn't have had a way to turn the thing on or off since it wasn't genetically sequenced to me, like the last one had. Too bad Dick wasn't here to do that for me. Did I just wish Dick was here? Must have been my imagination. After everyone in the squad had had time to check their gear and suit up, one of the members, who was perhaps the most fit blue giraffe I had ever seen, stood up and started delivering a speech or a pep talk to the group. I hope it was really inspiring because I missed every word. Guess I'll never know what was said. Reports say the battle is already underway on Helicor 4 and it's going badly, said Trixel, giving his usual pre-battle rundown. It seems that the main offensive line broke and is now fragmented over an area of about four Borotos, eight kilometers. We'll be dropping into the thick of it. There have also been unconfirmed sightings of a Volsa, so keep your eyes open. Our squad, as well as a few hundred others, have been tasked with picking up those we can find of the first offensive and then bring them back to base. We'll be moving in a roaming defensive circle formation. I don't want anyone breaking away and looking for their own glory. If we see a Volsa, I want an orderly retreat with covering fire in a layered switchback. Any survivors we find are to be returned to the landing zone and then we'll go back for more. This is a pack fight like most of what we dealt with, so any enemies we come across will likely be in groups of 10. The skirmishes will be quick and brutal. Any questions? What does Hewitt do? He doesn't have a gun and he didn't understand a word you said. Matthew probably should have kept his mouth shut, but he wasn't going to let Hewitt die because he hadn't been willing to risk Trixel's momentary anger. If he stays out of the way, I don't care what he does. If he starts tripping us up, I'll shoot him myself. Any other questions? Trixil glared at Manthiel, daring him to ask another. Manthiel silently promised Human that he would protect him and keep him from getting in the way. Good, snorted Trixil. A klaxon sounded. Get to our dropship then. You know the drill? Manthiel was swallowed as he strapped himself into the dropship's harness. Human seemed to have just realised something and was gibbering away excitedly. What was he on about? He better not be about to puke up the massive amounts of nutrient spheres he had eaten. Matthew guessed he would never find out, for at that moment the transport dropped out of hyperspace and into the middle of the part of the battle that was being waged above Helicor 4. The ship began to shake as its shields began absorbing shots. Trixel's squad didn't get to feel the punishment the ship was taking for long, because soon after dropping out of hyperspace their shuttle shot out of the troopship's bay and began the long descent towards the planet's surface. Things had gotten worse. A lot worse. I know I should have put two and two together. I mean, everyone had been suiting up for a battle. What should I have thought was going to happen? It still didn't seem real though, as I strapped myself to a seat next to Manthiel. I mean, I had woken up about two hours ago, had my first real meal in three days in half that time. I was now about to enter battle against an unknown enemy fighting for an unknown cause, over an unknown planet. With all those unknowns combined, I was feeling rather confused, and it didn't help when the shuttle I was in shot out of the troop ship like a bullet and turned his nose towards the planet beneath us. At first, I had a horrible feeling as I thought the planet was Earth. Then I checked the continents and couldn't recognise any of them, but it still looked a lot like Earth. Maybe smaller, but there was no way I could be certain. My discomfort with the current situation was only increased when shuttles on every side of ours started exploding. Every time one of them decided to see how life was as a fireball, our shuttle would rock ominously, and the entire way down to the planet I was clutching my harness, white knuckled and sweating. We made it though, I don't know how. When the shuttle was opened, I wished we were back up in space, at least it had seemed cleaner up there. Bodies were everywhere, eviscerated, exploded, dismembered, you name it. It appeared down there in one form or another. I know War on Earth is terrible, but at least battlefields don't look like the only form of firearm used on either side was some form of artillery. If someone was dead, then they were the kind of dead that left you unrecognisable. My squad seemed to know what they were doing, however, and they ran out of the dropship, formed a circle, and began trotting towards an area in the distance where the discharge of weapons could be seen. I followed after them, not wanting to get in the way. 
Matthew seemed to approve of my position because he gave me another thumbs up. I am glad I taught him that gesture. I sent one right back at him and he fell back into formation. My first pitch battle was actually pretty boring for the first 30 minutes or so. We didn't come across anyone. Really, it seemed like the dropships could have maybe dropped us a little closer to the actual battle. As it was, we seemed about 4 kilometers distant from where the fighting was actually taking place. As we got closer, I could see that the fighting was more like a pack fight instead, with small groups, each about the size of our squad, fighting each other whenever they met an enemy squad. It didn't look like there was any overshadowing strategy at all, just a bunch of groups got together and then told to fight. I was starting to like my position in this army less and less. I was dragged out of my musings as a group stumbled upon what I guess was an enemy group. Honestly, I couldn't tell. The enemy group was composed of an assortment of aliens like our own, carrying guns identical to ours, wearing combat harnesses identical to ours. The only difference was they were wearing white shirts and brown pants underneath their armour. Their group started shooting at our group, however, and my squad reciprocated, so I guess we were at war with them. Not needing any more instruction, I drew my lava scimitar, it was even cooler with a curved blade, and let flew towards the enemy. The first rick, 30 minutes after landing, was uneventful. The dropship had been blown somewhat off course and had landed two borots, four kilometres from where the rest of the ships had landed. Manthea wasn't eager to fight, though, and the problem was, everyone knew it. Manthea was a plital, a coward. He should have been dead. His old squad had been completely annihilated when a Volsa, which no one had known was in the battle, had suddenly descended upon the battle that Manthea's squad and the Dominion had thought was a victory in their favour. The appearance of the Volsa turned that around. Within a single rick, 30 minutes, the Dominion's forces had been in full retreat. Manthea's squad had been gladly following those orders, when the Volsa had decided upon his squad as its next target. Their commander, Krimol, had told his squad to fight and hold as long as possible so that others could get away. Manthiel had taken one look at the creature, and then he had run. Run away from the screams of his friends, run from the Krimol's curses, ran from his duty. He hated himself. What was worse, he had lived to tell the tale. The Dominion was losing, although he didn't want to admit it, and was desperate for trained soldiers. Manthiel had been reassigned to a new squad to fill up some of the holes in the paperwork, but Manthiel knew it was as good as a death sentence. The men of his new squad hated him, just as he did himself, and he knew that if he ever got in trouble, he wouldn't be able to count on any help from his team. Fate, it seemed, didn't care about Manthiel's wishes. After a short time jogging, Trixel was encountered their first enemy squad. It was an ambush. One moment they were jogging towards where they could see pulse gun fire, the next, they were surrounded on all sides, confused and dazed, as enemies appeared where only Chen Dirt had been before. There wasn't a Volsa with them, however, as though Manthiel's squad could have missed one of those, and so Manthiel, perhaps not calmly but steadily, aimed his gun and fired, concentrating his fire on one opponent at a time as if he'd been trained, trying to wear down his enemy's personal shield. Manthiel never got the chance to finish. A blur of brown, whitish orange, and glowing red flew towards the enemy with which Manthiel had been engaged. The blur shot past the unfortunate soldier, who immediately stopped firing, which confused Manthiel, until he realised that the soldier had a glowing hole in his gut, left by a fusion scythe. Human? It was human. Manthiel forgot about the enemy, forgetting to keep his jaw connected for the second time that day, as he watched in awe as their short, bipedal creature moved with the speed and deadly grace Manthiel had only ever seen in a Volsa. Humans seemed just about as deadly. Jumping from one enemy to the other, he stabbed, sliced, and chopped his way through the ambush, which would most likely have cost Trixel half his men if it weren't for the intervention. Only after a third of their men were dead did the rest of the numbers of the ambush even realise that they were quickly taking casualties. All fire turned against human. Nearly all of them missed, and the few that did hit were absorbed harmlessly by his combat harness. How would they have hit something like that anyway? He changed direction so suddenly and with such precision that the only way to hit him was to shoot all around him and then some. The enemy squad was dead in perhaps a re one minute. The surviving squad was silent for about that long as well. Manthiel found himself silently laughing as he remembered his promise to protect Human in this uncoming battle. Human had probably just saved his life, and it was only the first conflict of the battle. Well, Trixiel spoke slowly into the silence. I don't know what your new bunkmate's on, Manthiel, but I have some of whatever he's having. This battle was intense. Not in the same way my previous alien battles had gone. Those had actually contained more action than any of the fights I was finding down here. No. It was intense because they just kept coming. 
I had to kill off one group, my squad was basically just letting me do my thing at this point. Rest for about a minute, then run into another enemy squad. I was exhausted. My jumps were a mere three meters now and were significantly slower. During the last few skirmishes, my squad had even managed to take care of a few enemies before I had been able to attend to them. I found myself thinking those thoughts as I was wading my way through another enemy squadron. I was really interrupted when my personal shield gave out and I received a shot to my heart. The worst thing was I had a bruise there, or maybe it was several. If you've ever gotten a bruise after someone punched you, you'll know how much those things smart. If you've ever been punched in that same bruise again, you know that the pain increases exponentially rather than linearly. The pain focused me like nothing had that day, and I got a whole new burst of adrenaline. I was really starting to rely on that so that I could just feel normal. I had the head off the offending alien, whipping my sword around to slash the legs of another Xeno behind me. He fell on top of me, which was rude, but at least that gave me something to throw at one of his companions that was a little further than I wanted to run. Really, if it wasn't for the fact that I was in a battle, I probably would have been pretty bored. I took a few more hits, which hurt, but I got through that squad just fine with only a little help from my friends. Hey, at least they were good for something. Manthiel had been worried at Human's personal shield for the past few reese, few minutes. It had taken quite a few hits despite his blinding speed, and it wouldn't hold up forever. Just as he had feared, during the middle of another skirmish, Human's shield took one too many hits too fast. It collapsed, and a final shot found its way through the chaos human had created in the enemy's midst and hit him in the upper chest. Fuck, and here I had thought I might get through this battle unscathed. You fought beyond belief, little human. You won't be forgotten. Manthiel hide his gun back into position and continue firing. That's when he noticed that human wasn't dead. He was in fact very much alive. But his shield went down. I saw it fail, didn't I? As Manthiel watched, Human was hit once again, but aside from momentarily causing him to stumble, it seemed to have no more effect on him than it would have against a Volza. What is this creature? Fuck, not again. His jaw was really getting his nerves today. Trixil was shaking his head, muttering something about what he's having. Crash, one of the three heavies in the squad, hiked his anti-tank gun in his shoulder and blew out a long breath. I don't know what hellhole he came from, but Human fights like a Volza, just smaller. And fewer teeth. Piped in Yika, the squad grenadier. And fewer scale. Wrecked, another heavy, was cut short as the object of their jests suddenly decided to remind them of the reason it deserved their respect. I admit it. I had said that the battle was getting bored. Why I ever let such an idiot seem into my head, I have no idea. But I paid for it dearly. Dragons are real. Check that. Space dragons are real. And they're every bit as terrifying as they are in the stories. I guess I better specify which stories. Not the inheritance cycle because dragons aren't magical and don't talk inside your head. Not Game of Thrones because these dragons actually show up. Not Dragon Tales because just not Dragon Tales. We're talking the original dragons. Like the dragon from King Arthur and the Dragon. The kind of dragon that's basically just a massive killing machine covered in scales stronger than steel. There's none of that wisdom or magic shit, just claws, teeth, and a whole lot of speed and I was staring at one. First of all, I couldn't believe it. Here, in this world of fragile beings who were slow, weak, and couldn't make a serious rake gun to save their life, then I hoped it was like the rest of the life I had seen so far until it jumped at the 20 meters between it and our squad with the live grace of a pouncing tiger, and in about half the time. I barely jumped out of the way, and I mean barely. When I landed, I was covered in dirt thrown up by the dragon as his claws gauged massive grooves into the earth where I had been standing before. Another one of his claws gouged the earth at one of my squadmates' feet as well, except he hadn't had the foresight to jump out of the way like I had. Shit. My squad started running as a disorderly mob, and I would have joined them, but I didn't. I can't explain it, but I felt protective of them. Even though I just met them, they seemed like children to me. They were slow, clumsy, and seemingly new to war, at least war as ever I had seen it from my second-hand experience. I couldn't run, that would be abandoning them. This dragon was a being like me, at least as far as my new wars were concerned. Both of us were creatures of death. Faster, stronger, and harder than they could ever hope to be, sweeping away their greatest defences as though they were merely air. Unstoppable. How could I run away from this foe? I was their only chance. I was their monster from hell. 
I guess it had only been a matter of time before I met another one. I turned to face the dragon, raised my scimitar, bellowed a challenge, and charged. Manthea was crying. Not because of fear, but out of shame. He was doing it again. He was running from a foe that he couldn't beat because he was afraid, even though his sacrifice might have meant the difference between the life or death of another. He had been given a second chance to redeem himself, but he was making the same mistake. This was why his tears streamed as he ran. Because he was a coward. A sound like nothing he had ever heard before stopped Manthiel dead in his tracks. It wasn't actually all that uncommon, it was just a yell. And the battlefield was filled with those, dripping with them, stained with them. The screams of the dying would haunt this battlefield for days after the fighting was over. So why was this yell different? Manthiel looked to his source and saw why. It was human, charging the Volsa, fusion scythe raised above his head, challenging it in the very moment it was victorious. The rest of the squad, which Manthea could now see had been running as well, was in shock as a small alien charged the beast that could not be killed. The yell was different because it was an order. The shouts that filled the battlefield were pleas for a saviour and cries for release. The screams of the dying and doomed. This was a command. An order directed at everything in his path, a demand that every obstacle bend before it, a promise to anything that wouldn't bow, an assurance of destruction. The challenge shook Manthiel to his core, bringing hope where there had once been fear. The fear was still there, and in great abundance, but it was no longer the fear of a frightened creature struggling to deny the inevitable. It was the fear of a man who was fighting for the right to continue to live. Manthiel soon found himself giving voice to the shout as well, turned around, and charged back the way he had come. The squad followed suit. It was a good thing they did. Human was having problems. I may have been a creature from hell compared to your standard alien, but even as much as I outclass them, this thing outclassed myself even more so. What had I expected? It was a motherfucking space dragon! I respect my mother and you should too. I'm lucky I hadn't jumped attacked it or else it would have swatted me out of midair and that would have been the end of my defiance. It's what is left falling at me which I ducked. It recovered instantly and jumped at me, attempting to crush me through sheer force of impact. I dived to the side but it clipped my legs and sent me spinning into the ground. I hit hard, feeling the vibrations in the ground as it landed, spun around and charged me, preparing to finish the job. I knew I was about to die, but who knows, maybe I still had luck. I tried my best move and rolled. It worked. The dragon ate a mouthful of dirt as it closes more above the ground where I had been moments before. The problem after you roll is that you have to stop rolling eventually and take the time to get up. The dragon wasn't going to give me that time. I finished my roll and could see his clawed foot rushing down to greet me. Fuck. I was blown out of the way of the dragon strike by an unknown force. Actually, I'd felt that before. Someone had shot me out way of imminent death with an anti-tank pulse gun. At least they shot the ground right next to me, which was enough to send me flying several meters out of the dragon's reach. It hadn't come quite fast enough though, and the dragon's claws left three red gashes across my back. This was the first time an enemy had made me bleed, and I got to say it scared the shit out of me, and hurt me more than anything I'd felt in space combat so far. My new friends were helping me, and boy did I need it. Unfortunately, aside from the helpful push, I don't think they were managing to do anything but annoy it. Their weapons were even more ineffectual against this beast than they were against me. Heck, I doubt they were even bruising it. It completely ignored them, jumping after me, the only real prey I'd have found this entire battle. I knew the feeling. As scared as I was, I'd never felt so exhilarated. Springing to my feet, I dashed to his side, ducking under his lunge and scoring a hit on his back leg. It swiped his tail at my feet, which was a really good move because it worked, and I was on my back again for the second time in the fight. It spun around, attempting to put me in the same position as before. I knew where that would lead, however, and instead curled up into a ball and somersaulted towards and under the beast, getting out of its immediate line of sight. This is how I know it wasn't as safety into dragons in modern stories, because if it had been intelligent, it would have just smashed its body against the ground and be with it. Instead, it whipped itself around like a cat trying to find a mouse that they'd just lost, by which the time I had gone back to my feet and had leapt for its side. It turned into my strike, which meant I stabbed its shoulder rather than its lungs. Roaring in pain and anger, the dragon snapped his body like a whip, dislodging me and my sword from his shoulder and freeing us 15 meters before he slammed into the ground. My trusty scimitar fell from my hand. Not so trusty after all, I guess. I was exposed, out of position for a boost from anti-tank bro, and unarmed. Rolling in triumph, the dragon left to me to finish the job. It pulled up short again, although more out of shock than anything else. Human was down. 
He had lost his sword and seen days from the colossal fool that should have killed him. The Volsa could see that it had won. Rowing in triumph, he prepared to leap upon the exposed human. Manthiel didn't know what made him do it, but he was close enough and he did. He took two quick steps and then hit the Volsa in the wounded shoulder with his gun. It didn't even fire as he just smacked the deep stab wound with his pulse weapon, using one of the most advanced personal weapons as a club. Fight more than one of us, he screamed. Come on, there's more than just human. Fight all of us. It actually worked. The Volsa recoiled, although it may have been in shock rather than pain. When Manthiel got a look at his eyes, he could tell that it absolutely was shock. Shock that such an inconsequential a creature had dared to lay a finger upon his mighty side. Manthiel could also see that he was screwed. Manthiel had distracted it, which was all I needed. He also put himself within neck-hugging distance of the dragon, which was not a good place for him to be. Dragon neck hugs can be lethal. I had regained my feet and decided Manthiel could use a little boost of his own. Reclaiming my scimitar, I jumped four times to cover most of the distance, then dive tackled Manthiel. I think I broke three of his five legs in impact, but I was able to drag him five meters behind the dragon, which saved his life as the dragon closed his jaws over where Manthiel's head had been. Pushing myself off the now unconscious Manthiel, I faced the dragon again. We were both bleeding, tired, myself more so than it, and ready for this fight to be over. It jumped, unfurling its leathery wings unnecessarily, as it only had to cover a short distance. Screaming a challenge, I charged as well. The dragon should have watched my hips, because hips don't lie. It attacked with its head, thrusting it forward to sink its teeth into my soft flesh. My soft flesh wasn't there. I had dived to the right on the final step of the charge, ending up next to the dragon's now exposed neck. I plunged the sword as deep as I could into the back of the dragon's skull. It convulsed, hitting me with its shoulder, ripping the sword from my grip, and throwing me another seven meters. I have to confess, I landed in a bad way on that last throw, and blacked out on impact.